Okay, it's time to get controversial. We're going to talk about the history of cannabis use and the words that we use to describe it. Let's get into the long, complicated history of cannabis in the U.S. Welcome to Discover Marijuana. I'm Tim Pickett, a medical cannabis expert practicing here in Utah. We have Blake Smith, a bioanalytical chemist with Zion Medicinal, and J.D. Lauritsen, the head of legal affairs and compliance for Wholesome Co. Did I do that okay? Yeah, legal compliance and government affairs, but close enough. It's, a, it. it's a real mouthful. Today, we want to talk about the long and complicated history of cannabis in the U.S. and kind of where we're at now specifically. Um, we want to really talk a little bit about the word marijuana, cannabis, ganja, pot, weed, all of those things. Devil's lettuce. The devil's lettuce. Satan's cabbage. And, and this is a this is a touchy subject. This is we have done we've had multiple conversations about this before. I'd like to just go through the history as I see it a little bit and and stop me here if I'm wrong. This is a an oversimplification. But you basically have, in various parts of the world, the cannabis plant growing, right? In the northeast of the U.S., at the colonization of the U.S., they're growing a lot of hemp, what we would consider hemp. In India, they're growing what, in medicine at the time, we were calling Indian hemp, which leads to, to the idea that that was likely the psychoactive version of the hemp plant and that difference. In Europe, they were primarily calling it cannabis. And in the scientific literature, they've always always called it cannabis, cannabis sativa. That's the plant. That's the whole plant. Now, I understand that in the U.S., the migration of uh, Mexican immigrants through the early 1900s really brought this term marijuana to the forefront. And then that term was essentially because it was more common in the colloquial term, it was used as a propaganda term kind of against the population as this migration of, of immigrants, blacks from the South and Mexican immigrants from the Southwest were going into the US. And there is a long and complicated history in there of really this suppression and this reefer madness. I mean, JD, talk a little bit about that middle middle of the 20th century period for cannabis. Certainly. So before 1910, um, the word marijuana was really not in the American lexicon. It really became in fashion, you know, was kind of brought to the forefront by, you know, by the government as they were attempting to suppress cannabis and really were attempting to suppress, um, you know, Mexican people fleeing from Mexico and jazz, black jazz musicians in the South. They used it as a way to weaponize cannabis against those communities. So as you move into the to the early 1900s and into the 19 teens, a lot of people don't know that Utah was actually one of the first states to outlaw cannabis. Some people believe that we were the first state, but I think it's more acceptable amongst the masses that California was the first. But Utah was really early on. And you look at a lot of the journalism that existed at the time, it was very much to vilify those communities that were using cannabis. And it was a way to try to kind of find a scapegoat and someone to blame for, you know, the Great Depression and some other things. And so you fast forward to 1937 and we passed the Marijuana Tax Act at the federal level and it didn't outlaw cannabis. It just tied a tax to it that was so expensive and the, the potential penalties, the civil penalties, the you know, the fines that existed if you were found in violation were so prohibitive that no one really grew cannabis, um, you know, at, at that time. And so then you go even further forward to 1970 when the Controlled Substances Act is passed as part of, you know, broader, you know, cannabis, you know, prohibition. Um, and cannabis was never meant to stay as a Schedule One substance. A lot of people don't understand that. It was put into Schedule One, but it was supposed to be studied and then, based on the results of that study, it was supposed to be moved to a different schedule. Well, there the were multiple studies, and one even in the seventies where those, the Schaefer Commission, the Schaefer, and came out in support of using cannabis and keeping it in. And the pharmacopoeia from the medical side, you know, we the the medical providers were pushing to keep it in for the most part, 
But because of the federal rules, it kind of just it got removed. Yeah, I mean, cannabis was in the pharmacopoeia as far as back as the 1800s. It mm-hmm. was in there for almost 100 years until 1940 when it was removed. It's interesting that that coincides kind of with this. People hear the term reefer madness all the time. It's actually a movie. And I recommend that all of you watch it and you can see what the, it shows you how people thought of cannabis back then, right? That it, that it, that it, you know, just made you crazy and it made people make, you know, poor decisions and just all these things that these two reports, there was the LaGuardia report that was in the 1920s that said much the same thing as the Schaefer Commission report that came out in the 1970s. Both of them were buried, right? And cannabis continued to remain, you know, illegal. What's interesting is when you see Nixon leave office in the 1970s, during the Jimmy Carter administration, there was actually a push to, for decriminalization. Um, and this I know we're going to talk more about in, this. Um, California, the, there was some compassionate use in the 70s. Yep. And so you saw a number of states decriminalize. But then by the 1980s, with the advent of Reagan and, and Nancy Reagan's just say no to drugs, you know, the just say no campaign, it yeah. kind of fell back out of favor. It wasn't until 1996 that the first state, California, passed Proposition 215 that, that legalized medical cannabis. And it wasn't until 2012 that Colorado and Washington saw adult use laws come online. So where we've now gone since 2012 to where we are in 2021, we've gone like at light speed to, to see it. And it's really amazing to see cannabis come to where it is, but you still have the vestiges of prohibition. We, it's still illegal at the federal level. There's still 40,000, 40,000 cannabis prisoners across America. And I think the quote that sums it up the best for me is once your pharmacies or your dispensaries start to look like Apple stores, there's a whole lot of people you need to let out of prison. There's no question about it. And I think, you know, from our perspective, all three of us really in this industry and who we are, you know, what we look like and how we're involved in this, I think that it's important it's important to know the history and know that this is really rapidly changing. Like we're just part of a huge movement. The reason I think this is so important, I love the way that you're talking about it is because even my experience, if I were to be pulled over as a white person in the cannabis industry with my credentials and so forth, will be treated dramatically different from, you know, actually a large portion of the population. And, and, I support every single thing that you're saying. One thing that I do as a scientist, I actually always, there's a time I need to jump back in and be a human because there's times when it's easy for me to say, well, if we look back to the actual history of cannabis sativa, we can trace it all the way back to 3,000 years in Egypt. And I can be very, you know, scientific and clinical about it. And the fact of the matter is we have carried the cannabis plant all over the entire planet. In fact, humans have been more responsible for carrying cannabis around than we have any other agricultural product on the planet with maybe the exception of wheat. Right. And so, um, yeah, so that's all fine and dandy, but let's get back to the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter is, well, look, there is inequality, social justice issues. And even right here, the three of us are are white middle-aged, you know, men talking about the inequality that has happened. Dang it you know, and, but we're the ones who are profiting in this industry currently. And so I I agree with everything you're saying. I, I, that just makes sense to me. Yeah. And I think it's the duty of the industry to, to stand up for a lot of these things. And you're seeing that happen, um, in a lot of States, you know, I know it's not perfect, but I know a lot of States are really focusing on this. I know there are a lot of cannabis companies that are focusing on this, you know, as well. And I think it's our duty as an industry to, to, to do that. I think also it's important for me somebody who is using the term marijuana in a name to, to tell people that I, I use the term, we use the term because we don't mind where anybody comes from. I want to use the term that you want to use. If you want to use the term cannabis, you want to use the term ganja, pot, weed, marijuana. I, it does not matter to me what term you want to use. To me, what matters is that I destigmatize the plant as a medicine and then I meet you where you are so that I can help you learn to accept it, learn to use it as another tool in the toolbox. I feel like that's my role um, right now. I, I really like this discussion. We certainly are, like Blake said, I mean, we're, we are, you know, here we are. We're not going to put a period on the end of this. This is an ever-changing thing. 
I think we're, we're trying to do our best. Um, and, you know, if you have comments, and this is one of those videos where I know we're going to get a lot of comments, we're going to get a lot of, um, a lot of interaction here. People have strong feelings about this. Uh, please be respectful with the comments. Um, know that we're, we're trying our best, I think all of us, and we want to give back. We just want people to understand that the plant works. It, wor it can work for a lot of people in a lot of conditions. There's a lot of history around the plant and it's fascinating. It's, it's a fun industry to be in. It's exciting in a lot of ways. And I think focusing on that is a good place to start.